Welcome to NCC Unplugged, the podcast from Norman Christian Church, where conversations, community, and culture converge. Hi, and welcome back to NCC Unplugged. Super excited that you're joining us and listening. Uh, I'm Jonathan Slatt. I'm the youth minister here. I'm joined by Jeff Terpstra, our preaching minister. Hello. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about his role um, kind of what inspired you to mm. come into preaching ministry, how you got there, um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, This is weird not being the one to open it, but that's okay. Isn't it? Is yeah. it hard to let go? It is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, <laughs> when I came in and stepped into this position of youth ministry, I guess you had your position before I had this position, though. Yes, yeah, so I was preaching before you came in as youth minister. Yes, that is correct. Right, so how did that transition sort of start, or do you want to go back to how you started in youth ministry? Where do you think is the best place to start to talk about this? Oh, well, I was born March 24th, 1984. So that makes 9 you... 9 a.m. How... No, I don't know what time it was, but that is my birthday. Um, so preaching is... Okay, where do we start? Uh, preaching was never anything I thought I would do. Hmm. I think it was an option. But when I was at Bible college, being 19 years old, 20 years old, I was like, I'm I'm not going to preach at a church. I'm going to do youth ministry. That's what I, you know, everybody else was doing. So I did youth ministry. And some, some of the guys in youth ministry, so e- even though I said preaching was never what I wanted to do, um, I think that's fully, I think that's true. Um, there's there's some guys in youth ministry that said, "Man, I'm never going to be a preacher. I will always be a youth minister." And that was for some reason their like line in the sand. Mm-hmm. And they're like, "I'm youth minister for life. I'm not going to youth ministry is not a stepping stone to quote unquote real ministry." And I, I agree with that. Um, but I was never someone that made that commitment either. That youth mm-hmm. ministry would be my life. Um, before I came here to Norwin, um, between my last job and this this job. There was other things I looked at. Um, I looked at teaching. I looked at um, being like a like a foster, w- w- look, working in a, a school that houses kids and mm. kind of being like a foster dad or a foster parent in that mm. kind of context. So it sounds like people and caring for people was always kind of part of the equation. Would you yeah. say that? Yeah. And, mm. and, and still always in a Christian context, mm. you know, I wasn't, I was looking at teaching in a Christian school. It mm. wasn't going to be outside of a Christian school. Um, it was, you know, Christian agency for, for different things. And so I definitely wanted, and, and that's, I think ministry too. I think ministry in a broader sense, we're all called to do, mm. but um, maybe paid ministry, you know, is what yeah. I was looking at, at doing. And so I was, I was open to a lot of different things, came to do youth ministry here. During COVID, our our preaching minister went to a, a different church that he was familiar with over in Ohio, um, really started getting interested in, in preaching. And I, maybe before that a little bit, was thinking about it without yeah. even knowing it. Um, I can't say I read any books. Like I, I wasn't... I wasn't after someone's job. I wasn't. Mm. Um, I wasn't like distancing myself myself from the the kids in the youth ministry. Mm. Like, wow, well, we're gonna have to say bye pretty soon. So I'm gonna start, you know, taking some steps out. Mm-hmm. That wasn't it at all. Um, and now I find myself here. Yeah, been preaching for two years or so. Um, made that transition during COVID, interviewed with the elders to see if I would be a good fit, talk to them about how I would see directions and um, direction of the church and philosophy of preaching and different things like that. Um, so I was able to solidify some of those thoughts about preaching during mm-hmm. that process too. So that was, yeah. that was helpful. Yeah. So in those those two years of, of doing this now, how have you kind of felt your identity or purpose um, changing like what's what's the foundation of what you would do as a preaching minister would you say it's a big question Mm -hmm. um okay so if you mean my identity as a person i would Mm -hmm. say that hasn't changed Mm -hmm. um garrett actually gets to preach about it in two weeks Mm -hmm. it's it's one of the sermons in first john that i'm not preaching that i'm like man i really wanted to preach that passage (laughs) because i love that passage first uh first first john chapter three starts off by talking about how we're children Mm -hmm. 
And the world doesn't understand that because the world doesn't know God, but we know God and we're his children. And I think being a child of God um, has always been a strong identifying marker for me and something that just resonated me for, with me for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, he has adopted me. He has ransomed me um, to call me his. Mm-hmm. And, and that's been strong with me. And so I, so when I look to myself and, and who I am, I don't think my, my, my greatest identifier for myself has changed at all. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you are maybe thinking more specific as far as, um, how other people identify me, you know, Mm -hmm. before I was identified as a youth minister and we laughed and when, when I was interviewing you about some of the, the myths and bad raps that Mm -hmm. youth ministers get, um, I like you always tried to shake those off. I was never the last one to a meeting because I didn't want to be the youth minister that wakes up late Mm and, you know all that stuff. And so I'd, I'd come early. I was very hesitant to wear jeans to church at all or on stage. Cause I didn't want to be the, the, uh, just the one to break those barriers as right. youth minister. Cause that just comes with the stereotype of things. And so mm. I was maybe overly self-aware of some of that stuff. Um, so, but, but now people see me differently, whether I like it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I would not consider myself the head of the church. One, biblically, the head of the church is Jesus. Mm. He's the one that started the church. Um, but people may say that as an offhand comment. Oh, mm. you're you're the face of the church, or you're the head of the church, or it's your church. I've heard even other other uh, ministers say things like that. Um, and I, I, our structure here at NCC and what we see from Scripture is that the elders play that role. Mm. The elders um, here at NCC are those that, that really form the direction of the church and deal with um, some of the, I don't know, I don't want to say bigger spiritual matters, but maybe that's the best way to say it uh, when it comes to things here at the church. And so I'm under their direction and supervision, and but I'm also here every day, and I'm, well, I try not to be every day. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. I preach almost every single Sunday, so I, so for many re- for many reasons i'm the face of the church right. and i am what people would say am the leading force in our vision because i communicate that mm. um and so that change in identity has been a bigger change than i thought yeah. that would that would hit me um i as a parent maybe this this metaphor will help a little bit as a parent I am I am responsible for my child's faith development to the best of my ability. Mm. Um, my child may choose not to follow their faith, especially when they leave my household. But I'm going to do everything in my power to get them to make that choice, follow through with that faith, be a disciple of Jesus. Mm. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they make their own decisions, and that faith needs to be theirs. Um and so, in many ways, I feel like that in the church. Um, I feel responsible for the direction as much as possible for people to become disciples of Jesus Christ. But I also need to remind myself, at the end of the day, people are going to make their own choices. And so as much as <laughs> the mm-hmm. phrase, you know, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Right. Um, but then I recently heard in addition to that phrase, mm. you can lead a horse to water, you can't make a drink, but you can salt its oats. What does so, that mean? So you can you can get them to be real thirsty by putting salt in their food. Ooh. So you can get them to to drink more that way. Hmm. And that that's not like a sense of manipulating the horse, <laughs> but that you can um, you can do everything. And you're you're not just saying, okay, here it is. I'm going to lay it out. But you present it in a way that people are going to want it. Hmm. Uh, you put in a, you you make people realize the need that they really have for the gospel, mm-hmm. and that choosing Jesus is better than any other choice. Wow. You could choose, uh, you can choose your own way, but how do we see that going in the world? How do we see the rates of divorce and depression mm. and all these other things, drug use, are skyrocketing? Why? Because the ways of the world are just empty. Mm. And so I'm going to do everything in my power to sh- to lead you to the water, to the gospel, to salt the oats a little bit, to make it appealing. 
not at the cost of the gospel, but so that you see just what the gospel could do for you in your life. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't know if that got at the question yeah, a little bit, but that was a great answer. Okay, yeah, good. well done. Um, yeah, so um, we talked about this a little bit when we interviewed me for youth mm-hmm. ministry, um, but could you kind of go into when you think about that that thirst and and that need for Jesus? You know, what are some some verses or passages that drive you in preaching ministry to deliver that, that keep you encouraged when, yeah. when things are discouraging. Yeah. I mean, so much of the New Testament, the Gospels and the, the letters and Acts, the foundation of their lives was the church. Mm. I mean, for these Christians, they surrounded themselves with one another. And that came with issues, and sometimes that's what the letters were written for by, by, by Paul or others to deal with some of these issues that come up but to just see how they devoted themselves to each other and to the mission of glorifying God in their life and seeing the news about Jesus, the Messiah that they've been waiting for so long, finally mm-hmm. came true. And they saw him and they, they touched him and they experienced him. Um, you know, in the, the book of Acts, we, we use this in our growth process when we talk about uh, connecting. And so mm-hmm. Garrett and I, shared some of this on stage, but Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when they have the the presence of the Holy Spirit coming down on them. This has been promised, but they didn't quite get it, and now the disciples are gathered around. Um, the Holy Spirit comes down like like fire upon them, and they start preaching, and immediately the, the church is formed mm. um, right there. And so then the church's practices uh, become every day meeting together. Wow. And so um, Acts 2.42, let me find it here. Uh, It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so that's what we would say today at preaching is, apostles' teaching. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm taking the apostles' word. uh, And the apostles were these first followers of of Jesus, those that walked with Jesus and those that saw resurrected Jesus. These are the apostles, and they have this authority to teach. Mm -hmm. Um, To the fellowship which is gathering together, doing life together. It's part of what our small groups are. It's part of what we do on a Sunday morning. It's part of uh, why we have a a prayer sheet in our bulletin because we want to know what's going on in other people's lives. We want to pray for them and lift them up Mm. Uh, to the breaking of bread, which is communion. We take weekly communion. We focus our conversations and our mission and our ministries on Jesus. And why on Jesus? Because he, he went to the cross for us. And so that's worthy of our attention and, and our, our um, coming together. And then the last item is to prayer. And that's uh, part of their gatherings. It talks about how they had everything in common, verse 44. They gave to anyone who had need, verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. And then just so many examples throughout the New Testament as people continued to meet and, and get together. Um, we talked that passage in First Timothy um, about youth ministry and not people not looking down upon them because they're young. Mm-hmm. And uh, First and Second Timothy has a lot of instructions for church um, church structure because Paul is giving it there uh, to Timothy, and so some of that comes through and. Through that, um, it says, uh, verse 13, until I come. So Paul wants to visit them, and he's saying, hey, until I visit you, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. And so I just wrote a little side note in my my Bible. This is what the church does. Mm. We get together, we talk about Scripture, we preach, and we teach. And, you know, it looks different for different age groups, and so we have children's ministry and youth ministry. It looks different. Um, so that people, new moms can experience that. So we have, um, the family room and, you know, we, we just, we intentionally structure our gathering around those things that we see in the new Testament. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when we think, well, I can be a Christian, but not go to church. Um, there's a lot of, and rightfully so there's a lot of hurt that has happened in institutional settings and I mean that in more than just the church, mm. um, you know, businesses that don't care about their workers, mm-hmm. um, governments that treat people like like garbage and are just taking bribes and 
different things like that, we, we hear those news stories. And so there becomes this, this feeling within us that every institution is out to get me mm. and the people at the top are just trying to keep the people at the bottom at the bottom. And we can bring that into church and say things like, well, you know, I, I'm following Jesus, so I don't have to go to church for that. Or, I, you know, I, I love God, but I don't have to go to church to show that. Um, we just don't see that in the New Testament. Mm. We, we don't see that response or, or an expectation that, yeah, you can, you can just overcome all these things on your own. Um, we need others. And even, even I was listening to something and, and how we will say like, oh, they're a self-made millionaire. That's just absolutely not true. <laughs> Nobody can do it on their own. Right. Everybody needs other people. Yeah. And so whether we're thinking finances or whatever, we read a self-help book. The self-help book itself is not self-help. Somebody else wrote it for right. us. And so we need somebody else to <laughs> tell us these things. And so it's true. We, 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 and maybe it's an American culture thing where we think, well, as an individual, I can pull myself up. Individuality is the, the highest sense of being. Yeah, for sure. And, and then that infiltrates our view of church and, mm-hmm. and the priority we need to, to make with gathering together. And so, man, I just see what we, we do here at NCC, and I don't say just Sunday mornings, but everything we do. And, and there, this is an exaggeration, there's someone, some group in this building every single day, mm-hmm. probably three or four different groups using the building for different things. And as, as all those groups and all the people gather together, that is the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we just, we, we find that it's such a high priority here at NCC because we find it as a priority in the New Testament. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. That's so great. Um, kind of all part of that, like that salt, right? Like mm. showing people that, yeah, there is that hurt out there, but that's why you need here. Yeah. Right. That's why you need to come and, and, and experience Jesus with others. Yeah. Um, to kind of shift gears a little bit, um, you know, maybe lighten it up. So we did some myth busting when we interviewed mm. with uh, youth ministry. Mm-hmm. So I, one myth that comes to mind when I think of you, maybe not you specifically, but um, is that the preacher only works on Sunday. Right. Yeah. Shows up, gives a little talk, and then, you know, maybe thinks about it during the week and, and that's it. For sure. Right. So how accurate is that, you know? Oh, how it's, often it's do you right play on disc point. Golf? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. No. Um, preaching's hard. I mean, being a preaching minister is more than preaching. Um, make hospital calls, make phone calls, organize groups and teams for different things. And the one thing that we talked about um, – as the transition happened from me to preaching minister, Joshua went from uh, associate minister to executive minister. And so some of the shifts we made, the shorthand that we said was, I would be in charge of everything that happens in the auditorium and Joshua would be every, in charge of everything that happens out of the auditorium, like the the ministries and the small groups and the things that happen out of a sun, outside of a Sunday morning gathering. And that's, that's true for the most part. Um, but I still do a lot of, I mean, ministry is about people. Mm. And so if I if I showed up with a sermon and there was no influence from people I know, um, I just, okay, this is what the Bible says. Well, no, I, I need to know who I'm preaching to. That needs to form the message. And so I still take a, a relationships really serious and part of people's lives. And, um, you know, one example is the Vintage Voyagers, our, our group for... Uh, those that are older in age here mm-hmm. at NCC have a gathering once a month. They have a lunch uh, once a month. That's my favorite here at the church. gathering. Yeah. It oh, is. absolutely. The food's so good. Um, but to sit with people and to to hear what they have to say and to hear feedback and to hear, hey, I think this is happening, and and to have an ear to the ground of of what needs to be preached. Because, man, I could talk talk about something in scripture that just doesn't. Our, our church doesn't, not, not that we don't need to hear it. We need to hear all of scripture, but maybe that's just not something that's on top of mind. That's not mm. what we need to do to, to grow and to be fully mature in Christ in this moment. And so to know people is so important. Um, we as a staff team work together. And so if there's, we, we don't want isolated ministries. Mm. And so if there's something that the youth ministry do, does that we all need to step up and pitch in for, we'll do that. Um, if there's something we need to change with the way we do something, we all talk about it and we, we work through it and we come to a consensus. We never vote on things. We all, we want to talk it through and, and figure out the best way to go forward. And so just a lot of work with staff, 
uh, with ministry team leaders, with volunteers, with coordinating, hey, this group is using this, is this good, hey, the direction. It's something I re- realized recently being here on staff uh, now close to 12 years. Um, I've been on staff the longest by far. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, absolutely. you know, by five or six years, I think I've been on staff longer than anybody else. And so um, just some of that, I'm, I'm not... I don't say that to to make any sort of point other than uh, some of what we do is dependent on what we've done in the past. You know, Hey, yeah. if we tried it this way, Hey, when we did it this way or Hey. Um, and so that's, that's just some of some of the other things, I guess mm-hmm. I justify yeah. saying I work more than Sunday mornings, but yeah. one of the things I'll, I'll say this, one of the things one of my professors said in, in Bible college about preaching is you should, you should spend an hour of preparation for every minute you're going to preach. Mm. So if you know the sermon wow. is going to be 30 minutes, you need to be studying for 30 hours. Mm. And I found that to be true. Wow. And part of that is because I'm new at it. Mm-hmm. Um, once, once I get more familiar with it, once it becomes more natural and more of a rhythm of things, uh, I'm sure it would be easier, but... Some of it's um, writing a sermon and rewriting it because I want to say something later in the sermon rather than earlier. And, you know, I need this doesn't make sense in my head, so it's not going to make sense in others' heads. So I need to figure out an illustration or some other way to say it or or what's, you know, what, what's what's a, a supporting scripture to help mm. me get at this or to, to show this point. And, and it's just it's a lot of a lot of work and it's it's an art. Absolutely. I think it is. Um, it's 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 something that I've really enjoyed mm. being in the position, but yeah, it's it's more than just Sunday morning. Yeah, for sure. I do see you in here every once in a while, so yeah, it's good. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have I kind of have two more questions that I'm okay. just like selfishly curious about. So I'm going to build a scenario for you. Oh, okay. You get a call right okay. now, and they say, Jeff, we need you to preach in 30 minutes. Okay. Okay phone because I'm on a podcast. I'll, I'll but, pretend I have my phone yeah. and I'm listening. Okay. So they say, Jeff, we need you to preach in 30 minutes. Got it. What are you preaching on? Uh, same thing I did last week. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. my head. No. Um, what am I preaching on? Wow, that's a great question, Jonathan. You got any like back pocket things? or? Um, so I talked about identity before. I think identity would be a big thing. Like I told you, the first John 3, being a child mm-hmm. of God, I think we're, uh, we're called a lot of different things in scripture. And so sometimes we need to live into that identity. Mm. We don't fully believe it. Or we've listened to the lies of the world that uh, me and my parents told me I was a failure so many times. That speaks a lot louder Mm -hmm. than the victory of Christ I have, or that speaks a lot louder than being a child of God. Um, My identity as, you know, a father, and I just feel like I can never live up to what I've seen other fathers do or my own father. And I just, I don't have enough time for my kids. And I just, I, I feel that and living into the identity of um, being a work in progress and, and being, I, I don't have to be perfect at it, mm-hmm. but doing the things that, that I know God wants me to do and knowing that God can use those things because I am his child um, and he is my father that he can work in me to reach others. Mm-hmm. Um, so identity is a big thing. I think uh, the gospel of Mark, I've always had a special affection for. Mm. Um, and so I think I'd, I might also just open up to Mark and see what's going on there a little mm. bit and talk. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So then one last question. Uh, you, you spoke to this a little bit when you were talking about relationships and, and knowing people. Mm-hmm. You know, when you are deciding, like you said, what, you think we as a church need to be focusing on and what, where we need to be fed and how we need to follow Jesus. What are some of the factors that go into deciding what you're talking about yeah. from stage? Again, I, being new to it, I'm trying to iron out a process a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of it is figuring out what we as a church need. And so I'll think through what we've talked about before. Mm-hmm. Um and it's not just all topical. Sometimes it's um, the book of the Bible, like we're in right now with First John. Uh, we've done Mark before. We've done Daniel. So it's it's seeing the season. Sometimes it's seeing the the dates on the calendar and going. Okay, we have eight weeks until Easter. Um, 
we're going to have a lot of new people here on Easter. Do we do something building up to Easter or coming out of Easter for those that may be new to the church? Um, over the summer, a lot of people come and go. Mm. There can be with people's vacations and kids out of school. And so during the summer, we'll do something that week to week isn't dependent on being here the week prior. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so this last year, we did the, the names of God. And so each week was a little bit more independent. You come for a name, maybe you miss a name or two, you can catch up. Hopefully you listen online, catch up. Um, But so there's some, some purpose to that. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's really just listening to the spirit and and really going, okay, you know, we, we haven't covered this before. Is this, is this what we do or do we hold off on this? Um, I have a few books on my shelf that like, man, that book just put to words what, what I've been feeling and this needs to be taught, but I just haven't felt like it's the right time. I think it just needs to simmer a little bit. Um, I need to prepare a little bit more. Mm. Um, there's been series in the past where I've sent it out to the staff and go, Hey, does, how does this sound? Do I come off, um, as too aggressive on this topic? You know, is this the right time for it? Is this, is this what we're doing? So, and some of it, maybe the majority of it is led by our, our goals as a church, mm-hmm. you know, if, if we want a goal to reach other people, then we're going to do some sermon series and some talks and some scriptures on how to evangelize to other mm-hmm. people and how to have the build in those relationships. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things. There's definitely not one answer to that question, yeah. but there's a lot of things that go into doing that. And I, you know, I, I really, I don't want to overanalyze it, but that's one thing that I really work on because I do mm-hmm. feel like that's a a big thing that leads our church in certain directions. And, yeah. and so I want to be very intentional and purposeful with those things and really think God speaks through those things. And so I want to take those absolutely serious. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah, so much that goes into it. Um, well, I appreciate your openness and, yeah. and everything you've said. Yeah, Is there anything else that... We haven't talked about. You really wanted to say anything on your heart, or no? I, I you know, I love being here at Norwin. Uh, both my wife and I so appreciate um, the time that we've been here, and just the people that much more than just friends, much more than just um, doing ministry at a church, but really just doing life with others. And so we we love it here. We love the people. We love the atmosphere of of being on staff and just being by supported by so many different people. I mean, I, I wouldn't have taken the wouldn't, wouldn't have, I always, I always misspeak on these things. I'm like, man, it's good. I'm speaking for a living, but, um, I don't even remember what I was going to say anymore. You wouldn't uh, have, we, we would not have stayed at, as, as preaching minister at Norwin, taking that position if we didn't enjoy the people, mm. mm-hmm. you know? And so that's, that's just proof that we really do love it. And we think what God is doing here is, is so neat and so, so important in the world. Wow. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. If you need prayer for any reason or you want to meet with Jeff or have questions about Norwin becoming a member, um, feel free to reach out to him or to anyone on yeah, staff. Yeah, through the church sure. website is bestnorwinchristianchurch.com and, and find my little picture there. And Yeah, it's a nice Norwin. picture. Appreciate that. It's worth looking at. Yeah. Your mom took the picture. Yeah, she did. Yep. All right. <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to follow so you don't miss anything, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to NCC Unplugged. If you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we encourage you to share this with your friends and family. NCC Unplugged is available on all major podcast platforms. And if you're ever interested in experiencing Norwin Christian Church firsthand, we invite you to join us for our services every Sunday at 8.45 and 10.30 a.m. We have engaging classes available for all ages, ensuring there's something meaningful for everyone in our church community. For more information about NCC or any other inquiries, visit norwinchristianchurch.com 